Hi, it's Kiffin Lobates here, and today I thought I would bite the bullet and start a video series on central bank digital currencies. Now, this is a bit of a minefield to enter into because it involves macroeconomics, and the problem with economics is that it's not really a science, it's more like politics or religion, in that everybody has an opinion on it, everybody thinks that their opinion is the right one, and everybody disagrees with everybody else. So it can lead to some quite heated arguments. So central bank digital currencies, what exactly is that going to involve? Well, I think first we need to step back a bit and have a quick look at what money is and what central banks are. So you can see already that it's a, a tricky topic. So central banks are entities that are authorized by governments to handle monetary policy, the issuing of money and setting um, targets to ensure that things like inflation don't happen, that employment is kept high, and that the monetary system keeps rolling. They have a huge quantity of responsibilities. I mean, another one is that they're the lender of last resort. They're the bank for banks, as it were. And in the Western world, they're all pretty much independent entities. They're not actually a government department. They're actually a private institution that has been authorized by a government to handle all these issues. And that is supposed to be beneficial because by decoupling the handling of financial policy from um, vote-seeking politicians making short-term decisions, you're supposed to end up with a better economy. Although, of course, we've seen a lot of troubles over the last few decades in the handling of macroeconomic uh, policy. So uh, that's central banks. Uh, if you ever want to run one, my advice is to make sure that you first get a very high position in a, a bank like Goldman Sachs, because uh, that's where they seem to draw all their top level staff from. Um, now on to money. Again, it's uh, in the first chapter of pretty much every economics textbook. Uh, it tends to be summarized now as having three functions. So it's a medium of exchange, uh, which means that it gets rid of a barter economy and allows you to trade stuff more efficiently. It's a unit of accounting, which means that it gives you a standard by which you can value things. And finally, it forms a store of value. Now, not as good a store of value as some other things, because you want to keep money circulating in the economy. So it does need to decrease in value over time, according to current monetary theory. Um, but you can stuff it under a mattress and fish it out a year later, and you will still be able to buy something with it. Whereas, for example, storing eggs or mushrooms under your um, mattress is not a good form of store of value. So that's the background. And for this video series, I'm going to be looking in particular at what is called the M0 money supply. Now, as it turns out, about 90 to 95% of all the money in the world is actually already in digital form. It's on databases, in banks, it's in spreadsheets, um, it's not actually in physical form. So when it comes to a bank issuing a digital currency, I think that what they are talking about there is the M0 money supply, the hard, cold, COVID-19 and cocaine infested cash that sits in people's wallets. And um, that's going to be the topic of the next video. What would be the benefits to various groups for issuing money in a digital form rather than in a, a physical form? What would be the benefits of replacing the M0 money supply with a digital version? So see you in the next video soon. Bye for now.